Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to wait for a few seconds as we kind of gather you all and enter you into the room and then we will begin. So, good morning. Um, I am delighted to have Mark Hill with us, which we will uh, have a little sort of chat and go through what Mark Hill has done to date um, and his biography in a minute. But really, um, it's wonderful. This is, uh, I think, episode three in the second series of Lepada Leaders. Um, we have kind of opened them up to be consumer as well, but this really is kind of back to um, the trade. And we're hoping, I know that we've got a lot of Lepada members today, so thank you so much. And also um, some people from outside of Lepada as well who have joined us, and you are very welcome. And we will share this as well on YouTube later. So, uh, you know, many of you may know that Mark is also on the Bada Council. So we're all friends in this world, and we're all going to try to get, you know, sell as much as we can online at the moment, uh, which we need to do. Um, so, one thing before I kind of go into it is those of you who are new to this, you'll see at the bottom there is a QA box. Um, and as that goes, as we kind of go on if there's any questions that occur to you please pop them in there and then towards the end of the session we will ask put those to mark and indeed if you have a question for us as well and and myself and Lepardo then pop that in there as well also there's an area called chat where people might put some comments I think Gillian will try and put a link to um, some of the materials that we're talking about including the um, Renati marketplace guide and also a guide actually to photographing some objects and stuff so if we will try and put those on as the uh, webinar goes on um, but we will also send some of those links after um, and put them in our members newsletter so without further ado thank you so much Mark uh, for joining us today and um, it's true to be said we, we you know we all know we're living in this kind of bizarre coronavirus world and we all know that um, being online is essential and so when I we did some things obviously at the beginning of uh, the kind of the COVID pandemic where we were looking at Instagram and different areas to help you kind of market your items online but we really thought we needed to kind of uh, have another session and look at get sort of into the nitty-gritty of how to sell online and all the different marketplaces out there and who better uh, than Mark to join us because uh, he really is a kind of a polymath of the antiques world and we first met each other I think it's true to say of the sort of scientific instruments and pens and pencils in Bonhams, is it not? It uh, is, and that must have been in the <laughs> 90s. I mean, you know, it, we're not that old. We were mere children when that happened. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So Mark is um, best known uh, as a, probably as a publisher, writer, BBC Antiques Roadshow, well, who um, is involved in that, and also a collectibles and design expert. But he's kind of made the transition from the auction houses across to helping on various um, online enterprises, if you like, at the very beginning of the art and antiques world, taking this on, both in the development sector of one of the more, you know, larger auction houses, Sotheby's, um, and then also onto one of the kind of big platforms. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, he also sits on various uh, councils, such as BADA, also helps develop um, Renati's um, business proposition at the moment, which is very exciting. We should talk about that a little bit. Um, so really, there are many things that Mark can turn his hand to. He also publishes uh, his own books, uh, and you can find those, I believe, on uh, Mark Hill's website as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think we should move into the topic today. And I think really, you know, we all know the stats. We've been looking at kind of um, online guide market sort of reports in the ATG and the art newspaper about the kind of the massive rise in sales online. But when I kind of did a walk around recently in Ken Church Street, what really struck me is that obviously, you know, you sort of know the impact, but the fact that really there is very few people walking into those shops and now that we've had that tier two announcement again in London, tier three where maybe some of our other members are, um, 
that kind of where we used to do maybe 50 to 60 percent in fairs and in shops and the rest online that's completely reversed it's sort of 95 percent online and you know maybe five percent in the galleries and you know we do keep sort of marketing how safe and good the galleries are and how much attention you get you know if you go into a gallery if you kind of make the effort but I think we really need to look at what what is difficult about that is that for some who are already in a good place to to sell online it's fine but for those who kind of have that transition to make and also who maybe have higher priced items then you know that's the sort of the area that we really need to sort of help people think about how best to, to um, photograph and show their objects off so um, I wanted to maybe start with um, a, a, a picture from your side of how you're seeing the kind of trade coping with the pandemic at the moment before we get into some of those sort of tips if you like, Mark. Well, I think for me, you know, buyers have not stopped buying and dealers have not stopped selling. It's just the way we sell, as you've explained, has completely changed. Um, and I, I actually had a business lunch yesterday because we are allowed to do those things with, with an art dealer um, who's been uh, in business since 1986. Um, and his, his, his simple response to me when I said, how's it going, was, well, everything is selling. And of course, everything is selling, but it is, as you say, selling online. And we simply need to address that and just deal with our businesses differently. Um, and you've really kind of seen, as, as we kind of talked about at the beginning, you know, over the sort of two decades um, of antiques and art going online, you, you've seen it from the kind of the, the cold face and also inside um, the different organisations. Um, how has that kind of landscape changed and what have you learned to, along the line or what can you share with us, really? Well, firstly, I think there are two phrases I heard and I still hear. It won't work and I don't need it. Well, they're both <laughs> wrong, I'm afraid. Um, I worked in, initially with a company called iCollector um, after leaving Sotheby's.Amazon.com, who I, I, I worked on that deal. And iCollector struck a deal with eBay. Of course, we're all familiar with eBay and in, in specifically their, um, their live auction product. So what that did was brought live auctions, the ability to bid from your, you know, your, your home, from your laptop or home computer direct into the sale room. And I was right there, as you say, at the coalface, going out with salespeople who, who I brought on to sell this product. And it was always, it won't work and I don't need it. Some people went for it. They were early adopters, as, as we call them in the tech world, but um, uh, they won straight away. And instantly we began to see people bidding. So obviously if you have a good reputation, you have good expertise, and you, you're, you're known to be professional, your expertise will be trusted. And it just proved to be a different way to be bidding. First of all, once a success has happened, people would then say, oh, well, no one's going to buy anything big. No one will spend more than a couple of hundred dollars or pounds or what have you. That within months was proven to be true. Um, com com sorry, completely untrue. Um, and people spent hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and that began to really show that it is just simply a different way of buying. You do need it and it does work. And I'm afraid now we're looking at, um, certainly with Renati, bringing more dealers or enabling dealers to be more successful online. Um, I, I, I think I'm hearing the same things over again. And do you um, think that the sort of the collector out there, so the, the holy grail of these people that we're trying to develop and bring to us, so maybe the interior designers is one kind of sector that obviously actually is doing very well at the moment in the pandemic, but they really have so many projects. So linking to them, but also the collectors, do they um, kind of worry about whether they're buying from an auction house or a dealer or how, how can we kind of win in the online world if you like as as dealers clarity and communication clarity and communication that's what it's all about for me um and no i don't think people do necessarily worry and i think um there is still some sort of concern about the auction business because many people certainly who, who uh, you know are not used to buying a auction will be aware that there is this this premium this commission i have to pay which now can be sort of 30 percent or more so if you spend 100 quid it's going to cost you 130 quid and there is that sort of sense of uncertainty plus the fact that obviously if you bid at auction the price can only go up at least that's what everybody hopes except for you know ultimately the buyer but with a deal you're starting at a fixed price there are no commissions on top through barter site or all a barter site or wherever it may be so and you can negotiate as well 
Um, and I think some sorts of buyers, there are different um, or different categories of buyers. There are different passions and sort of other things going on. So an interior designer might be under a time deadline. They know what they want. They know the color. They know the size of the space they've got. They know the type of thing they want, be it a bit of furniture or painting, and they just have to find that object. So naturally, dealing with a dealer, you can immediately email. You can find out what the best price can be, shipping, all the rest of this business. But of course, you have to wait for an auction, and then you've got buyer's premium. And then, of course, you've got that enormous risk that you might not win it. Now, my partner is in, in banking, and we're very lucky and live in, in, in a very nice house, which we refurbished. But um, falling in love with wonderful pieces of Biedermeier, which is very much his, his, his preferred style furniture, you would get excited, you'd measure it up, you'd imagine you owned it, then you'd go to the auction and bang, it went to someone else. Cue heartbroken other half. Um, and I don't think that's something unique to him or me. I think yeah. that happens. But of course, if you come to a dealer, you can just negotiate that deal and then walk out with the object or have it delivered and have a smile on your face. And I think collectors will also find objects out there and just want to buy the thing. Obviously, the price will be important. That needs to be negotiated and decisions need to be made about um, condition, for example. But I think it's an awful lot easier to buy from dealers. So as dealers, I think we have a real opportunity here. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. And I suppose maybe we need to have no commission slightly larger and be less subtle about it when we talk about sort of clarity and transparency. Um, when, I mean, one of the things that I, I think is, is quite difficult is navigating that world. There's so many marketplaces now. And um, I just wonder, what do you think when somebody, a, a dealer is kind of looking to invest both their time and their money online, where, where should they start? How many marketplaces should they be on? And, and does their website need to sort of be all singing or dancing, being at the same level as some of those marketplaces they want to be on? What, what, where should they look to spend their most time and money to begin with? Quite a, quite a couple of questions embedded in there. I um, know, in terms sorry. of <laughs> no, sorry, in terms of marketplaces, um, I mean, I think for me, it's all about audience. So you can spend a, a large sum of money buying the best, the snazziest looking technology for your own website. But if nobody comes to look at it and you don't have the budget to market your website, to bring people to it, then you're sort of, I don't think you're wasting your money because it'll always look good. People will find your website, perhaps through Google searches, but you know, you won't have the, um, the marketing budget to attract as large an audience as, as a marketplace. And in terms of choosing marketplaces, I think it's a little bit really like just, you know, suck it and see, go and look look at the marketplace, is it, the, do they sell the sort of things or are there dealers on there selling the sort of things that you sell? Because that's what the audience will be expecting to see. So I think it's look at the profile of the marketplace, look at what's being sold on the marketplace or what's being promoted for sale on the marketplace, and then consider the audience that that marketplace is, is appealing to. Some will be more um, decor uh, sort of decorative antiques and interior designer oriented. Um, some might be more academically oriented. Um, and some may also differentiate by price level as well, or by expertise. Um, there are some sites like Venteria or Cherish perhaps that are, are slightly more modern in a look and less perhaps um, offering traditional antiques. I think once you look at the site, it's fairly, and, and what's on it, it's fairly easy to, to see whether you'll fit in there and whether the audience that site attracts are the audience that you want to put your goods in front of. And uh, perhaps you shouldn't be frightened to actually be amongst your peers and, and the, it's better to do that than be the lone wolf. And in, in, I suppose in the same way as when you look at a fair, people are expecting to see different but similar things and that's sort of more comfortable for them to then shop within that area. Well, I think that's also true, but think of the high street. I mean, if you want to buy a suit, you probably don't go to one of those sports shops, do you? Um, you know, you go to where you're going to find what you're looking for. And I think it's quite clear that sites have a certain profile or a certain bed. I mean, obviously, with a site like First Dibs, you'll find a huge, huge variety of, of, of items. But First Dibs really is one of the oldest, one of the very largest. But by and large, other sites work incredibly well. And I think some sites are perhaps also looking, some marketplaces, at dominating niches. Um, as we know, that can be a, an extremely sensible thing to do and a very lucrative thing to do. If you can become the owner, the go-to place for a particular niche, that can really work. Mm. Um, so to sort of develop your unique sort of selling point as always, you know, the sort of marketing thing. One of, um, one of the things that I'm very aware of, I would say, we've got, a, you know, we've got a, 
large membership and obviously they specialize in some very different areas but I think also in terms of how um, they present their their pieces online or in I think often how they might do something in a fair in the physical space or in their own showroom is absolutely exquisite and you can see it in that kind of 360 and you get a wonderful sense of how you should display it and I think that that's something that isn't always so easy to translate online, um, especially when I look through some of the images that maybe we have. Um, what would be the, the tips that you could give? And is there somewhere that they can go to, um, to to sort of show off their work to the best advantage? And I suppose this is thinking both the photography, but maybe also the captioning and, um, you know, and how much information to leave, leave in, that sort of thing. You know, since I was at, since I started working at Bonhams, one thing amazed me about dealers and now my dealer colleagues, and that is that the breadth of skills you need to be a successful dealer. You need to be good at marketing. You need to be good at sort of dealing with clients. You need to have obviously immense and and, and in depth product expertise. Um, and today, I'm afraid you need to be a pretty good photographer, um, and you need to be a pretty good stylist. Yes certainly you can go out and uh, sort of hire those skills and bring people on board to help you. But we are quite lucky in terms of the fact that the technology has made this an awful lot easier these days. I mean, mobile phone uh, cameras are extremely good quality and can generate um, great photographs and, you know, almost print worthy and print ready photographs. You can use filters as well to, um, and, and very simple programs that you can download with apps that will enable you to, to, to make a photograph look literally a million times better um, and actually on the renati.com blog you'll find we have tips there for taking very good photographs I think and it's something I wanted to mention before in answer to your other question there's also another side of it as well it's not necessarily just presenting the object which of course is critical um, with a really good photograph and as many of them as possible the bottom the top the side from an angle whatever it may be I think it's also presenting it in more of a lifestyle way so think about how retailers um, and high street stores and chains offer their goods because actually there are competitors somebody could easily just go and buy a modern piece of furniture or um, a, a modern picture or whatever it may be. We, we have to see ourselves as competing with the high street, offer it in a sense, a certain lifestyle, style of manner, taking a photograph of, of the object, I don't know, on a shelf or a fireplace so that it is a sort of styled shot, not just something cut out on a white background or a graduated gray background can make an enormous difference. But think about social media as well. You may wish, to take different photographs that you use for social media, so Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, to the ones that you're using to actually sell the object on a marketplace or on your website. Show a little bit of yourself as well. I mean, I, we're so lucky in what we do. I'm not saying it's easy, it's, it's a damn hard job. Um, we've got to go out and make money with our own money. But at the same time, I think people are quite curious about lives of the antique stealers. You know, what do we do? How do we live? Where, where do we buy? What's our day like? Um, so I think showing a little bit about who you are and, and sort of communicating some of your passion, I think, is, is also critical. I, yeah, and I suppose actually we're so used to now. I mean, now we are sitting in our, I mean, this is my home. This is your, this is a quarter of it. I mean, we're so used to seeing into people's lives now that we expect a bit of that character as well. And I, um, just kind of going back, I think that looking at shots for different vehicles is quite important. So um, I suppose if you have that lifestyle shot, what's also very important is that you can drill down into that object and maybe see it against a plain background. One of the things that occurs to me that I think might be quite challenging now is um, the amount of possible returns or, or how, how do you meet a client's expectation when they can't actually physically hold that object? You know, do we need to be much more aware about um, condition reports or thinking something that we know is to do with wear and tear and actually why an object might be so revered as the patina that somebody on the other end of that who is, you know, your partner, a banker, uh, who may be less aware of some of these things and they get it, um, it comes to their doorstep. How, how do we make sure that they don't sort of panic and want to return the object when it has that kind of wear and tear? 
I mean, I've, I've mentioned it before. It's those two C words, communication and clarity. Sending yeah. another email, putting another sentence in, saying hello, chasing up on something is never, ever going to be a problem. You know, we are human beings. And I think especially in this, this rather awful time where we can't be together, showing that you are a human being and showing that you care and just having very, very clear communication will always help you. Obviously, one wouldn't pester, but just giving that extra step, giving that extra mile. Um, um, after all, you know, if you go into a shop, you'll find people who are knowledgeable, passionate, even if it is in a sort of rather false manner. We don't have that falseness. We don't need that falseness. We really are passionate about the things we have. So let's communicate that passion and communicate um, what a buyer will need to know. You're right. Maybe the slight stain on there or the patina, as you say, might appear as dirt or grime to somebody, but explain why. Of course, once they own the object, it's up to them what they do with it. You might go crazy and love this um, art deco upholstery but they may have fallen in love with the shape of the chair and they get rid of it that's their choice but communicate explain why explain that out that original art deco upholstery although it looks a little faded is a most magical thing maybe they'll choose to keep it yeah well well let's hope so um i think no, that's fantastic i think i think it's it's just something that i've been aware of a little bit in terms of some of the communication we've had and i do think as you say it's very important to be transparent and maybe even offer a condition report if it's somebody who's a new client who's buying furniture or something that maybe is an area they haven't collected before and have a bit more of a dialogue and a conversation i did a webinar um, not in the Pada one, but on something else, and, and somebody who hadn't really bought before came straight onto the Lapada website, bought some paintings, made a new relationship with one of our members, which is, you know, that's when we go, tick, brilliant to yes. hear. Um, but, uh, and I think I, that went very well, but precisely they kind of built a dialogue, you know, she wanted something, the, the member actually sort of suggested maybe something else that was even better, you know, that, that sort of area. Um, you one, Go on, sorry, Mark. I was going to say, you know, there's another thing that it's, it's funny. We, we, we've both said it. We both use the term condition report. Doesn't yes. that sound a little bit scary? You know, yes. perhaps we should be dumping that and dumping the rest yes. of the jargon that we use because condition report sounds, it sounds like one of those awful things you have to do when you're buying a house. You know, I'm yeah. immediately scared. So perhaps yeah. we couch things in a different way. We think about who new buyers might be and what they might expect to hear. And condition report, I don't think is one of them. We we should get rid of jargon like that. Yeah. And think about, well, would you like to know what condition it's in? Or would you like to know, um, you know, have you got any questions about the way it looks or appears? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's also part of what I was saying about being human um, and also being clear and communicative. And actually possibly following on as well on how to then look after it as well in terms of, you know, whether you need to polish or whether actually too much polishing in the um, realms of silver can actually, you know, kind of create a problem going forward in terms of if it's embossed or, um, yeah, just as you say, be more open. And on that transparency, what it, one of the things that we've launched recently at Lepardo is Buy It Now. Um, and that we've kept it at a lower threshold. So it's sort of £5,000 under, which means that with shipping and everything else, it's never going to reach that anti-money laundering threshold that is, you know, another thing we have to contend with at the moment. But what is your thoughts about, I mean, you know, it's a constant source of sort of... Um, uh, tension maybe it's too strong but you know it's certainly a lot of debate around should you have a price should you not and I think there are many within our sector who uh, feel that it's better not to and that they can develop a conversation but for me certainly at the lower end I think it's very um, helpful to have a price and to keep the buyer engaged but what do you think about the sort of POA or estimate on request or price on what's what's your thoughts Mark on how people should do their pricing online? Well I think my eyebrows probably just gave it away POA a three-letter acronym for me is a four-letter word um, really do not do it. Um, I mean, think about if you go to buy a shirt or a suit or whatever it may be on the high street, you go onto a website, you, you see something you like, oh, there's no price. What do you do? You go to another site. That's just it. Um, you know, we live in an Amazon uh, world today where you go online, you find what you want, you buy it, you click it, and it arrives a day or a couple of days later, or even still the same day. A buyer will make a decision whether to buy or not, or a browser to become a buyer, um, immediately. Now, I understand, of course, the reasons why you might wish to put POA for, for certain 
items. I do understand the reasons behind it, but we have to stop thinking about it from our perspective. We have to think about it from the perspective of a person who has been attracted to our website or to a marketplace. And seeing no price is incredibly frustrating. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted that I'm not the only person who believes this. I think, um, in fact, your esteemed organization, Freya, had uh, Sir Stuart Rose a little while ago at one of the Lepada conferences. And it was, if I remember rightly, the first point that he made. Um, and he made even a comment about the fact that he was wealthy enough to buy pretty much anything he saw, if I remember rightly. But the immediate thing he would do is turn off and turn away if there was no price or worse, one of those dreadful codes. Um, he just wanted to know whether he could afford it. Is it 300, 3,000 or 30,000 pounds? Then you can start to negotiate. Can I have it? Yes or no? Um, it's so important. And I think in this day and age, we have to think about what the buyer is thinking about, not what our industry has dictated um, for previous methods of selling and how we've done it before. Thank you. Very, is that very, clear enough? I think that for me, I think that's crystal clear. We hit, we'll see what the other people think. It'll, it'll, I'm sure it'll start a fire somewhere, <laughs> many fires, but I'm really very firm on that. I never would put anything online without, without a price. It just simply doesn't work. You know, it's, yeah. it's wrong. And it's also actually one of the things that fairs are, are tending to do more and more of is, is really kind of make people have prices on their objects visible. Some people still try and do it in a book. One of the things that I'm always quite struck by is actually some of the sort of um, most high end dealers, if you like, uh, especially in the, uh, the picture world, they are always very bold and very confident about the prices they put on the wall um, and never kind of uh, try and sort of Hide that. Well, think, and of course, sorry, I was just going to say, of course, we know and the world and the, the world and our, our buyers know that that is the start of a dialogue. It doesn't have to be the, the absolute end. And if you're an interior designer or an art advisor, you're, you're going to start kind of negotiating and, and, you know, going beyond that. But it also gives people a guidance as, as to where to start. Well, I think that's true, but I think it's also, um, it's, it's not terribly, um, it's certainly not fair on the buyer, but I think the, the buyer or the browser then ends up thinking, well, hang on a minute, are you checking me out? Are you trying to get as much money? Are you looking at my shoes or the cut of my suit or, or jacket to see if, you know, you can push that price up a little higher? It's, it's not clear communication. Um, and I think it immediately puts a browser or a buyer sort of on a wrong foot in a way and makes them feel slightly uncomfortable about what might be going through that vendor's mind, that seller's mind. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of doubly bad. Yeah, and actually, I think that's something that we all as a, as a trade have to think about in terms of we need to put the power into the buyer because there are so many impediments in the sense that, I mean, we used it as our argument to the DCMS as to why we should be able to open shops and galleries because mainly you have to ring a doorbell, it's very safe, you know, it, it's sort of, a, a, you're only let in when you do that. But of course, actually in the normal world, that is quite an impediment. You've got to make, somebody's got to be confident enough to ring that doorbell, to come in, to have that conversation, to start that dialogue, to cross the threshold of a fair, to cross the threshold of a stand, um, it, it's all of those things. So we've got to try and remove as many of those impediments as not so that we can sell all our objects. Um, and another thing that I hear from members quite a bit uh, in terms of a slight reluctance or an anxiety is the amount of time um, that they need to invest in social media. And it's quite honestly for some, and I, I think it's interesting because Instagram for me is such an aesthetic vehicle that actually it's a very natural um, form of social media for our members and for our world because it's all about kind of you know be beautiful imagery really but um how, how much time do you need to spend and um and is it worth it should they all be on social media well, I, I think it's about getting into a routine and getting into a habit. And I think it's also about understanding which area of social media works for you. For example, I'm just speaking personally, I found I have a, a fair few followers on Twitter, but I found engagement, which is when somebody responds or, or does something, acts after or based on your, your, your message, your post. Um, engagement has dropped dramatically. Facebook, I find, has a slightly more mature demographic. Um, and, and conversely, Instagram, oddly enough owned by Facebook, has a much younger demographic. So I think the first thing to do is think about which platform you ought to be on, and then just try and get yourself into a habit of, of, of tweeting or Instagramming or whatever it may be regularly. 
Um, and again, as I said before, I think show a little bit of your character, show a little bit of your, your human side. You know, some people will post, you know, bottles of wine, whatever it might be. They'll post tramping through a field in, in the rain, whatever. I think that really does help. The hard sell often doesn't. And I think it's true to say that for many people online, they want to find something out um, before they sort of start following you. So if you give them a little something, they'll come back and probably um, follow you and then hopefully buy. But also think more technically about integrating your activities on a marketplace or your activities on your website with Instagram and social media. So if you've just brought an amazing collection or um, some fantastic pieces, you know, maybe Instagram about it with a teaser, then when they go online, start to, um, to, to post the fact that you're putting these pieces on or that they'll be on next week or whatever it may be. Think about um, using blogs and generating extra content and then bringing that through social media. I just found this great thing and here's the story behind it. And a small teaser on social media with a link through, if you can do that, Instagram doesn't allow it, Twitter and Facebook do, can just bring more traffic to your website and build up a story. And we all love a good story, I think. And actually, just on that good story, I think that people sometimes, again, get slightly overwhelmed by blogs and things. But actually, I mean, from my experience, and, and you are more experienced, they don't have to be terribly long. They're better if they're not, aren't they? Well, that's absolutely true. I've been blogging since 2006. And as you probably detected already, if I can use 10 words in a sentence, I'll use 40. Um, <laughs> and I tend to write far, far too long uh, blogs, far too much detail. Um, and you're right, they do need to be short, snappy. And if you're doing a blog, please avoid the hard sell. Um, you know, it's, it's this business about sort of tempting people in with bits of information and stories, giving um, an online browser or buyer something to draw them in, um, and then they're more likely to buy. But something entertaining, light, and without a hard sell, and short and to the point, is, is going to win out. And again, illustrations are important as well. But as I say, put it on your blog. What you, you'll find there is you can obviously social, put it through social media, through Instagram, Twitter, or what have you, to promote, to bring people to your blog. So every time I write a new blog, I do a post. And Google likes that because it sees you posted something, and then it sees an awful lot of people coming to your site. Beyond that timing and beyond that time scale, you'll also find that um, the more Google sort of indexes and appreciates and understands your site, uh, people will come to your site and dwell for a little bit longer on it, which also is, is, is a good factor. So somebody might read a blog and that means they don't bounce off the site and disappear again for a while. Um, and they might, if they really enjoyed it, look um, at other parts of your site, at other blog posts, what you've got for sale. Uh, one of the things I've done that works incredibly well, um, as I say, I've been blogging since 2006, is to write about some of the more obscure areas in my area, in my fields of, of expertise. Because if there is very little or nothing indeed online about it, and there are maybe half a dozen people, and I work in a very niche market for sure, who are looking for information, they'll find your site because it'll appear at the top or high up in the Google results, and they'll dwell on your site longer, linger longer, and move through the rest of the site. So sometimes just putting up good niche content can really work. There's um, one of our members, I think, who, who has a quite a niche discipline, um, Sean Clark, so Christopher Clark at Cabinet Furni Campaign Furniture. Um, he does a series of little mini vlogs, if you like, on social, uh, sort of Instagram, and they're really good, but they're always for sort of slightly esoteric um, items, which means that it's really interesting. It's a really great story, as you say. There's um, a, a phrase that I've used in sort of marketing when I do the, the lectures for Sotheby's Institute and stuff, which I I always think is quite a good one which is a billboard in the desert because actually you might invest everything in your wonderful website but unless you have all the signposts kind of directing you to it so the blog um instagram facebook twitter then nobody sees it so it is kind of just thinking about how do i get all of that directional traffic going in you don't want to be the billboard in the desert and one of the things i was going to say about twitter actually is i i agree with you what i find i mean there are funny things still that go on twitter but what i find quite interesting for us is it's an area where journalists and academics um 
still are kind of very active. So if you're churning out opinion or information, so whether it's about Brexit or Ivory, or whether it's something that you want journalists to pay attention to, or it's something to do with the kind of cultural conversation and the museum world, then Twitter is quite a good vehicle to have those conversations. But in terms of selling and making things look beautiful, then Instagram and Facebook are, are much better. So I, I agree. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think it is, as I say, important to be aware of the demographic as well. I mean, I think we're all thinking to the future of our businesses as well as the current state of our businesses. And it may be that the demographic of people on Facebook is more correct for now and perhaps the next 10, 20 years. But what I'm really intrigued by at the moment is the demographic of Instagram. You know, if we mm -hmm. can show younger people that these are incredibly important, interesting, fascinating, worthwhile objects to, to own and enjoy owning, I wonder how that will reflect on our business business in say 30, 40 or 50 years time? Is it going to be that, um, that, that if we can tempt them in now and make them feel welcome, then in the future it will pay off. Hopefully we'll all still be around to enjoy that. But I think the, the trade needs it and the industry needs it as well for the future, whoever's selling in 50 years time or so. And surely as well within that same sort of um inspiring that younger audience or tempting them in is is our green credentials that sustainability where it's not we're not greenwashing I mean it is genuinely at the heart of our business is these things are not just recycled they're reused and they've been around for hundreds of years and we should own that conversation and you know you get to have something that is kind of stood the test of time doesn't know has no carbon footprint um you know and is going to be with you for the future I think and it's individual it's not kind of like a you know one size fits all ikea look you're getting something that actually expresses your personality your individuality i think that's true and i think we perhaps in the industry have a little bit of a fatigue of of antiques being green we shouldn't we should actually just refresh it and keep yeah. moving with it one of the um, most popular tweets i've done which got nearly half a million engagements which was remarkable was one that i just thought about on a train journey long train journey coming down from an art society lecture um, and it occurred to me that I was using far too many plastic cups. So my sort of post lecture glass of wine on my three hour train journey back. So I bought myself one of those little Edwardian collapsing cups in the little leather pockets um, with the gold wash and the uh, silver plate on the outside. And um, I tweeted about this with it literally just sat on the fold down uh, shelf on the seat in front of me. Um, and everybody just loved it. The fact that it was single plastic, it hit the nail, as a single use plastic rather, it hit the nail on the head at the right time. It wasn't anything special. It came to me literally within five minutes of ordering this thing. But as I say, half a million engagements. Um, and another point I wanted to make was sign up for something called Google Analytics. I know that that tweet actually brought people to my website because with Google Analytics, which is a free service that Google offer that plugs into your website, it will give you reports on who's been, where, that, how many people have been, how long they stayed on your site. I'm sorry if many of you know about this, but there are some of you probably who don't. It's incredibly powerful. So I could see for the following days, five, six days after that tweet, that very innocent, immediate tweet, my website visitors spiked enormously. I sold more books and I had more inquiries about objects I had for sale. So there it really was social media working from spending time. Social media doesn't cost you money. You just have to spend time turning, spending time into earning money. Yeah. And I think also, actually, it is those things like train journeys or uh, quiet time where you can actually bank quite a lot of content that you want to then share. Um, one of the other things that occurs to me about those little shooting cups, little collapsible cups is of course with the silver, copper, or I mean, all of that uh, is actually Corona safe as well because it doesn't live on that for very long. Um, you've got a cat appearing, have you? Yes, I have. She's yeah. um, being very needy because um, it's wet outside today. <laughs> that happened to me. I had a tail in coming up here the other day in a, in a conversation, which was quite funny. He's sulking somewhere in the corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right about it being Corona safe, but it's also very good because, of course, obviously, apart from the environmental side of it, people are not handing it to you. So right yeah. now, this is a very good thing. It's no, just give me the whatever it is I bought and, you know, or you go and pick it up from whatever and pour it in yourself. So it's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah, perfect. Well, I, well, a great thing. That's what should be on everybody's Christmas present list now. So anybody who's listening out there now, send us that so we can do some nice social media things on the Lepada website for that. There Christmas is nothing... Present. 
There is nothing better as well, Fred, that when you're on a plane, you say, oh, no, I won't have a cup, thank you. And you just sort of raise your cup like that. Um, it says a certain something to the other passengers. Uh, you know, some people may think that's a negative thing, but um, I think it's just a bit of fun. And, you know, ultimately, that's what we all want. Ultimately. Do they meet, immediately move you to first class when you do that? Good Lord, no, they wouldn't <laughs> let me in a place like that. Heavens, no. Good heavens. Okay. Um, but I think choosing your marketplace, going back to that, is actually a, a, a very important uh, point. Um, and yeah. really, I would spend a lot of time doing that over and above, just to flesh out one of your previous questions, looking at your own website. I think it is very easy to get, it's much easier rather to get involved in a marketplace than it is to, to found your, set up your own website, create a blog, maybe do that a little later. The first step or the first very easy step is to get online with a marketplace. Um, Renati have produced a guide to marketplaces, which you can download online. It's um, free to download from renati.com. And that will give you um, a review, many in the words of the, the marketplaces themselves, of each marketplace. So you will be guided instant. You can do your first sift, if you like, by looking through that guide. And the, a, a product that Renati are producing, which will also help you get online, uh, the e-commerce manager, will allow you to have a central hub for all of your stock in one place. Um, and then from there, it could be syndicated to different marketplaces, the marketplaces that you choose. So I think just using that, the ECM and the marketplace guide is probably the, the, the first very easy um, step. And it's, it's an affordable step as well um, in getting your stock online. I think also that, as correct me if I'm wrong, but with the um, ECM, so you know, the marketplace guide, by the way, has been put in the chat. Um, on the webinar so you can kind of see the link and also the tips for, for photographing small pieces is also up there um but so not only does is there the kind of um guide to all of the different marketplaces but once you actually uh, come on board with renati and you put your um objects on these different ones there's a, a monthly report that spits out how they've been performed as well you can kind of go back and see um, which I think is incredibly valuable and some people have the time to really analyse what all the different websites and how they're performing for them all the different marketplaces but sometimes you need to sort of have a, a picture for a full year month by month uh, before you can really know what's working at best for you what your kind of best return of, on investment is so I think for somebody else to be doing reanalyzing for you is uh, incredibly helpful. Well, I think that's uh, that's true. And that was, again, the point about bringing Google Analytics up before as well, because you can see where your visitors are coming from and what they're looking at. So you can come across, well, maybe a lot of people have looked at this object, but it was too expensive, or a lot of people have looked at this object and there's another issue with it because no one's bought it yet. You can find out the country they're coming from. Um, I think as well as the fact that it has never been so easy for, for dealers and for any business really to market globally. It's never been easier and we've never had more in-depth information as we now have selling online. The internet has been, and I understand why, a very scary thing for a number of antiques dealers. And I do get the reason why that is. But once you get to grips with it, you'll find literally a whole new world opens, not just a whole new world of buyers, but a whole new world of information that you can actually sift through um, and learn about. That would have been completely unavailable to us before. Um, just be because we'll kind of open it up to questions in a minute, but I just wanted to go on to one more thing. And the, it's sort of talking about information and the academic or the scholarship side is, is sort of just percolated in my brain um, but we've talked a lot about very um, it's sort of not new but but digital ways of marketing but should we dump all the other ways? should we dump doing catalogs should we dump those things or actually are they a way of us showing our credentials if you like as dealers and well I love a good catalog I mean, I love a good catalogue. Um, I think they're, they're wonderful objects and I think they do a number of different things. Um, I think first of all, they, they allow you to create something that is over and above and more than just a collection of objects together. So you can theme it, you can, um, you can even theme it personally. These are you know, my 20 favorite things I've bought this month or this quarter, whatever it may be. I think it also introduces a little bit of a, a sort of time sensitive element, if that makes sense. So obviously if a fair is on for three days a week, whatever it may be, 10 days, that, that gives you that time sensitive nature there. You're, you're, you're encouraged to buy the object before somebody else does and before everything goes away again. And I think there's a certain element of that with catalogs. 
Um, and I, I just also think you really can show your sort of professionalism and your enthusiasm in a catalogue as well. Um, I, I'm a great fan of catalogues, so no, I, I, I do them and I don't think they are out of date. It isn't all about, you know, 90 characters or whatever it might be. I think we can adapt some of the old ways. You could, of course, choose to print the catalogue and send it to some of your clients if they like to hold something in their hands. I mean, that's what our business is about, isn't it, really? Holding something in your hands. Um, or you could just leave it to them, create a PDF, have the PDF downloadable from your website, and if they wish to print it out at home, they can. But no, I don't think all the old ways are over. Um, there, there, there are other ways of, of bringing them forward. But the wonderful thing about the internet is it makes an awful lot cheaper. No printing of postcards and sticking of stamps on top or running it through that machine. Um, no, no, no printing of catalogues. It, it, it works very, very well. And presumably um, as well, just in the way that unfortunately, because we can't really do very many fairs at the moment, um, unless we're prepared to be outside in this lovely weather. But um, <laughs> I don't know, it's raining a lot. Wherever you are, I hope it's better. But here in London, it is raining and raining and raining. Um, but you can kind of use the catalogue to work a little bit like a preview by emailing it to your top clients before if they're sort of noting a particular object and saying just before this goes live, I thought you might like to see X um, because it's something that you've shown interest in before. Oh, you're giving away all my secrets. That's, of course, another thing I do. Um, I have a, a very strong and robust mailing list, which I've built up um, by keying in MailChimp um, and making sure that it's very easy to sign up to my mailing list. And naturally, as absolutely, as you say, what I will do is send the catalogue out and give people two weeks, which in all honesty is really three weeks. But it makes my, my mailing list, rightfully, as they should do, feel a little special. They're offered something before the general, you know, the general people, whoever else it may go to or sometimes I'll put the object through auction if it doesn't sell or, or sell it on in some other way but absolutely offering it to your your client base and your mailing list first of all really does work and I think the other side of it is as well having something that you can store somewhere maybe some people save them in their laptops or they print it out and stick it on the coffee table eventually I've had sales from much much later I found your catalogue again oh do you still have that and even if I don't, I've often made a sale because I've been able to go back and say, well, no, I haven't got that piece, but I've got this one by this designer. And, you know, what was it about that piece that you liked in the catalogue? Oh, well, I've got this. So there is that sort of a reminder. Um, and I've often made sales long after simply because somebody refines it. Very, very good to hear. Um, one final um, question I was going to ask was in, in terms of attracting because obviously what is wonderful about the internet and living in this sort of slightly frustrating world is that although we can't see people and travel ourselves very easily actually our objects can and they can into any time zone um, and anywhere but should we be doing different things to attract an international buyers well I think we can do and I think just yes, the object can indeed travel that's very true but again I'm going to pick up my mobile phone because actually this is an incredibly powerful tool for many of us so you can get um, apps like WhatsApp for business which can be integrated to your website so effectively if somebody signs on or looks on your website at sort of eight o'clock wherever you are in the evening um, and you, a little message can pop up you can choose whether to answer it or to have a feed, uh, an auto, auto response but let's just say you're sitting there at midday and somebody who's in Hong Kong messages you well actually you can go to your shelf or wherever it may be pick that object up and have a whatsapp call with them or a whatsapp video call so you can then show them the object you know even scaling it in your warehouse or in your store wherever it may be um, can actually help but I think looking at international buyers, understanding the time scale, they will also understand that you can't get back to people to them immediately. But being able to have that immediacy of using something like WhatsApp or a video call, FaceTime, whatever it may be, is incredibly powerful. Noted, I think. And that, that is a very good way, I think, to sort of end and go on to questions for the moment. Um, and see what what is being asked of us. So, Gillian, have you um, found a question for Mark? Um, the... Yes, yeah, sure. There's a few here. Um, one person has asked, "What is your opinion um, on dealers not revealing sold prices? Is this necessary, or is it another tradition from the industry?" 
That's a, a really interesting question because I was actually thinking about introducing a sold gallery on my own website. Um, I don't have one at the moment. You know, I, I don't mind personally speaking um, whether there is a price on there or not. But what I do like about the fact of having a sold gallery um, uh, or a sold category within one's own website is the fact that that will help with Google keyword searches. It will also help people understand that if they don't see what they're looking for right now, that you have had one in the past, so perhaps you can find another one. Um, I think it's, it's a really good idea to have it, but as regards having a price on that, I'm not, I, I don't have an opinion on that, actually. I'm, I'm not so fussed. I would just use it and as a dealer. I would see it much more as a, a way of getting people to my website through keywords. Okay, Great. thank you. Um, also, there's one asking if you have any tips um, for promoted posts on Instagram. Uh, for example, what interests um, do you put into the campaign as also things like um, what location are you targeting, etc. Well, again, that comes down to what sort of area you are. And I'm quite niche. My areas are really quite niche. So I will use certain keywords. I tend not to use many paid adverts um, on either Facebook or Instagram because I am so niche. Um, but I think looking through Instagram, I mean, it's like the advice they give you when you're selling on eBay. If you, if you don't know what it is or you're having some concern about what to price it at or how to describe it, look through the category on eBay and see what else is there. And I sort of think that's so true with, with tags and, and learning how to use Instagram and Facebook. Look to see what else is there and where you want to be. Tags and hot tags change so frequently. I tend to look through to see what's you know, the buzzword or the buzz tag of the time. But then really it comes down to how much money have you got? Because obviously if you have a very large sum of money, you can take all of the, the keywords, tags and, um, and options that you want. Um, <laughs> you just have to consider what your budget is, I suppose. But certainly it's also, as a final point, true to say that really Facebook and Instagram only work when you pay them. So they work many, many times better. Freya is nodding in agreement there. <laughs> Um, you'll really notice the, uh, the, the upturn when you start to pay them. It's like it's like anything, you know, free is good, but um, paid is an awful lot better. And I was going to say, it's just very easy to stay within budget as well, because they normally hopefully, helpfully let you have a sort of a capped amount that's either per month or um, per week or however you want to do it. So you don't kind of overpay, which is great. You can kind of keep it within that. Um, I mean, it's not it's not inexpensive either. I think that's the other point. I, I know when I first came across it all a couple of years ago and did it for some books I was launching, I was horrified to say the least about um, how much it costs to possibly have a buyer that probably just somebody who was vaguely interested or lazily flicking through Instagram or Facebook to come to my site or come to my product. However, I did remind myself, having worked for auction houses, and I'm sure many of you have produced them too, print catalogues, how much those things cost just to produce and then to send out. And I thought, well, actually, if I'm targeting somebody in their home at a point where they are looking for that object, um, then that's got to be better, hasn't it, than something just tumbling through the door one day or one morning. So um, I, I, it, it does work and it is worth doing, but um, I would definitely encourage looking through things first to see where you may fit and what's working. Um, I'm, I'm going to let you go in a minute because I know that you have something that you want to kind of possibly bid, bid on. on. Yes. So uh, <laughs> time is sort of uh, marching on. Um, but one of the other questions we we had, which follows on to that, is is how important are hashtags and and is that the best way to grow your followers? If you're starting from not many followers, how do you quickly augment them? So obviously the paying is one way of doing it, but but how important are, are hashtags and? Uh I think hashtags are incredibly important. Um, people do follow hashtags. Um, don't always go for the most popular ones. Again, niche can work because if you have more followers or, or, or sort of, or um, you have, you're posting more frequently, if you are within a niche tag, you're a big fish in a small pond. Whereas if you just go hashtag antiques, lots and lots of people use that. So you have to have the, the influence and the positioning to be able to move up correctly. Um, so I think that that's an important one. Um, and in terms of, sorry, what's the second question you asked, Freya? I've, <laughs> With, I was thinking uh, so quickly growing your followers, tags. how to how to quickly ramp up your followers. Obviously, one of the, one of those ways is to pay for it, but it, I I think again sometimes that's about niche, isn't it? In in understanding 
you know, if you're specializing in art deco jewelry, you, you very much build, you look at who to follow within that area yes. um, and start to maybe have a dialogue, say things that flatter them, build up a conversation and, and start that way as well to grow your followers. I think also the other thing, I've remembered what it was now, thank you for nudging my mind, I'm thinking about bidding, you see that's the problem, is um, <laughs> respond to people. So it is yeah. all about engagement. So if somebody sends you a message, wow, cool thing, just write back thanks or smiley face or whatever it might be. Um, and if you do respond, I, I, I've been told that the algorithm is 45 minutes, whether that's true or not, um, within a certain time period to show that you do engage with your followers. That mm. actually does good things for your post on Instagram and will, and will push it up and more people will see it. All of these social media platforms like to see you being social. The clue is in the name. So if you show that you are social and you do get back to people in a very timely manner as soon as possible is, is best, then you'll find that your post will instantly do better. Also, your followers will see you in a better light. So they're more likely to think of you, um, go to your website, follow you. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, engagement as much as using the right hashtags is important. Thank you so much, Mark. We will let you go in a second. Thank you. Um, I just want you to agree with me that the, the key things, the key takeaways are be social, communicate, transparent with your prices and the service that you give, and maybe also celebrate your niche while you're looking for the best marketplaces to be on um, are some of the sort of key takeaways. And um, for uh, those who are watching today, we will put this on our YouTube, but we'll also circulate it. And if there are any questions that you want to ask either us and Gillian um, in the office, but also that I can email across to Mark or something, then please do um, come forward and, and ask those because we really want to just help you sell your pieces online and get you online as much as you can to reach the sort of market that um, we can't meet face to face anymore. Um, well, I think my final point, actually, if I could have one, is that yeah. This will not replace fairs. Fairs will return. Yeah. But when they do, all the hard work that you're putting in right now to get these pieces online, it will still be there and it will still have value. And actually, if anything, your business will be bigger and better as a result. Once we can go back and do fairs, once we can open our shops again and can do events, you'll have this fabulously strong backbone of business online. It's never the wrong thing to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for giving us your time this morning. Uh, thank you, Gillian, for um, powering the webinar and looking at questions and, and filling the chat field for us. And thank you uh, to everyone who's joined us this morning. Have a great rest of the day. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.